eight or nine out of every ten days, you'd be on this list. And you didn't always get woken up to breathe, but probably two out of three of these days, you'd get waked up at two o'clock in the morning, and you'd go down to the mess hall. You'd get dressed, you go to the mess hall, you eat, and you'd go down, you'd brief, and then you'd go to your personal equipment and get all your personal gear, your heated flying suits, uh, your flak suits, and that sort of thing, go out to the airplane. And as my grandson was asking me about flares, uh, one of the things they did was you didn't uh, have any radio communication. When they fired a flare, everybody started their engines. And then the airplanes taxied out when you're ready to take off. The first airplane, they fired a flare, and then away you went. So at any rate, uh, our co-pilot, he was, he was having trouble sleeping. So he finally went to the flight surgeon and got some sleeping pills. So one night he was having trouble, so he took a sleeping pill. And we weren't on the schedule to fly, but they changed the schedule, so they woke us up about 2.30, and uh, he couldn't wake up. So we get down the flight line, and he's sort of dragging his feet, so finally he decided the only way he could wake up was to open up his kit and take a Benny. So he took this Benny, and we went through a briefing. We got out to the airplane, and uh, we got in it, and they fired a flare. They scrubbed the mission because the weather was too bad. So we all went back to the sack and had some sleep. And poor old Cappy, he couldn't sleep. So he got on his bicycle and he rode around all day. And uh, long about seven o'clock that night, he was tired, but he still couldn't sleep because he still had energy from that Benny. So he took another sleeping pill. And two o'clock the next morning, they woke us up again. <laughs> And uh, so we went through about three days of this, and uh, we finally got off on a mission, and uh, he was worthless. He couldn't, he couldn't fly there. He, wouldn't, he couldn't fly that airplane. So I had to fly the thing myself. And uh, the thing about a B-24 is it was a, I thought at least, it was a fairly easy airplane to fly if you just flew it around. But uh, when you filled it up to the maximum gross weight, then it flew sloppy, and when you took it up to 25,000 feet, it was real sloppy. And then when you tried to fly it in close formation, it was a hard job, it was muscle. It took a lot of muscle to fly that thing, and you were just doing this the whole time. And so uh, I had to, we came back and I had the flight surgeon ground my co-pilot for about three weeks, for which he never forgave me, <laughs> uh, but I'd do it again in a minute. Um, and so we flew in squadrons of 12. You'd have three, the, the flight leader three, and then you'd have three more in what they call a bucket, which is underneath like that. And then you have three more in the low left and three more in the high right. And so the problem with all this was that you were not too many miles an hour above a stall speed, and so when you try to turn one of these things, uh, you could turn very slowly because if you turn very sharp, the airplanes on the inside of the turn go so slow they'd stall out even if they had to drop some flaps. So that, that part wasn't fun. And once the bombs came out, it flew better because you got rid of a lot of weight. So these particular uh, missions, these are two different missions I happen to be on. And so my name and my airplane are on there. I have some strike photos. Strike photos are where when we dropped the bombs, uh, there were some of the airplanes in each formation had cameras. And they would through a, a hatch in the bottom of the airplane, they would take pictures of when the airplanes, that when, I'm sorry, when the bombs hit. And uh, if you look at these strike photos, one of the things you'll see is, sometimes you see the bombs coming out, and you see bombs, and you see something that looks like a white pencil line going down, and uh, that was called a sky marker. So the lead airplane, uh, I'll take you through the way the bombing was done. Uh, we would navigate like this, and generally our routes took us, hopefully, avoiding any flak on the ground. And once you get to an initial, what they call an initial point, and the IP was something that was supposed to be readily identifiable, you get to that point and you do a straight line to the target, and I think it was something like 20 miles, and navigators have to correct me on this, between there to the target. And once you got on that, you couldn't deviate whatsoever. You were a straight line and whoever shot what at you, you were just a sitting duck going down that bomb run. So uh, most of the time the way we bombed was that the lead bombardier, you get on the, you hit the IP and you start down the bomb run 
and he'd open his Bombay doors, and everybody else would open their Bombay doors. And then when you got to the target, and his bombs came out, smoke marker came out, at that point, the other bombardiers would toggle out their bombs. So that's the way it went, and uh, one day, when we were dropping our bombs, the bombs came out, and the airplane went boom! Oh, oh, what's that? And the flight engineer said, well, I hate to tell you, but uh, the bombs didn't come out. Some of them got hung up in the bomb bay, and they're stuck. And these bombs had a little, uh, they had two fuses. They had a nose fuse and a tail fuse. Tail fuse went off on impact, but the nose fuse had a little propeller on it. And as soon as this thing dropped down the slipstream, this propeller would whine like this, and it made a couple of hundred revolutions, and it fell off. And once it fell off, it was armed. So here these bombs are sitting in our bomb bay, and these propellers are rotating around and talking to flight and well, what are we going to do about it? He says, let me see what I can do. So he goes back there, takes off his parachute harness, and we're at 25,000 feet. He's on an oxygen mask and whatnot, and he's straddling, hanging his legs over nothing, kicking these bombs. And uh, he finally got them loose. Uh, when things like this, you want to bless them, I'll tell you. So, uh, oh, one other thing I want to tell you about formation. Uh, we had a, a colonel who was an old fighter pilot, and uh, he believed in tight formation. And uh, the difference between flying formation in a fighter and a bomber is significant. Because when you fly fighters, you fly what you call fingertip formation. You fly like this, and you can fly these airplanes real, real close. And so you take four fighters and you just take off and you fly right through clouds, dense clouds or anything else, and you can still see the guy you're flying on, and so you just fly formation. But in an airplane like a B-24 with a great long wingspan, you couldn't get that close to fly through dense clouds. So there were occasions when uh, we'd have an eager commander and he'd fly us into the clouds, and, uh, and it was awesome. At any rate, our colonel believed in flying tight formation, and so the tighter the formation, when the enemy fighters would come at you. The whole idea was if you had real tight formation, all the guns, you know, you got 12 airplanes in a squadron and each airplane had, what, 10 guns, I guess? Yes. Uh, they're all the ones that were uh, able to fire in a given sector. All the guns of all those 12 airplanes are aimed at these fighters, so it was a formidable thing for a German fighter to come in against all that firepower. But the looser the formation, the easier it was for the Germans to come in and fly right in between the bombers. So we flew tight formation, and uh, uh, something I believed in. And uh, so uh, some of the squadrons flew looser formation. So I can remember flying on combat missions, and uh, when you saw the, the enemy fighters around, uh, you could tell American fighters and enemy fighters, even though they're little dots on the horizon, our fighters always flew in twos. And they flew a certain way, and you looked at them, and all that you, you knew what they were. And the Nazis flew in different kind of formations, and they didn't fly even numbers like we did. So you had a pretty darn good idea, even when you couldn't recognize a particular kind of airplane. So we'd see these things, and most of the time they'd just go right by us looking for another formation that was flying loose formation. So that's what I believed in. Now there were other guys that didn't believe that. They, f they believed that when you got flak shot at you, uh, if you were tight and the airplane next to you blew up, then uh, he could blow into you or fly into you and knock you down too, so it was more dangerous to fly tight formation. So this is a kind of a, a judgment call, and, uh, and I, guess the, I guess my grandson asked me this question, what's the most awesome thing you ever saw? The most awesome thing I ever saw is one day an airplane alongside of us blew in half, and I saw the, the nose part go up like this, and it did a stall and the tail part went like this. I saw a couple of fellows fall out of the waist and they didn't have their parachutes on. And uh, But things happen so fast, you know, when you're sitting up on a flight deck, you know, you see all this happen and uh, 15 seconds later, you're, it's gone by. The, the poor gunners, they're the guys that suffered because those poor fellows had to stand up in this freezing cold, 30, 40 below zero, and uh, they had to see everything that was happening. So it was, more awesome for them than it was for the guy sitting up there who's very busy twiddling knobs and levers and everything. Anyhow, I guess that's about all I have to say, unless somebody has some questions. Thank you.